This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Live. Once again, it's noon on Thursday, folks. Ted Ralston here at our Think Tech show where the drone leads uh, temporarily transposed to the subarctic region of Anchorage, Alaska, from our usual location, which is somewhere in Hawaii. Nei. Anyway, with me here in Alaska are, first of all, George Purdy from Lanai. I don't know Lanai. George, thanks for coming on board. And we have a newcomer to our show, Lawrence Morris. Yeah. From Unifly Inc., the U.S. Uh, regional manager or the general manager of, uh, of Unifly. Uh, and we're all here in the sunny subtropical areas of Alaska on the business of UAS. Why are we here in Alaska on UAS? Actually, you can see some in the background here, I hope, everyone. But what's, uh, what's most amazing is a conference that takes place every year in Alaska in this time period, put on by the University of Alaska Fairbanks under the title a quasi, which is the, uh, the center for UAS integration up here in Alaska. And Hawaii and Alaska are together on a lot of projects, and one of them is this one. And uh, we're fortunate in having uh, Lawrence here with, with us because uh, a program called the Unmanned Pilot Program is coming around, and you're in on that program, and so are we. So let's hear a little bit, uh, Lawrence, about your company, what you guys do, how you got here. Yeah, sure. Um, so Unify started uh, somewhere in 2012. Uh, the, the founders were former air traffic controllers, both from the, the military background and really? civil so real background. real controllers, not, yeah. not academic guys, real controllers. <laughs> Absolutely, not the guys in the tower. Cool. Uh, okay. dealing with, guys with, uh, in the tower, that's great. Absolutely, okay. and, yeah. and they were dealing with that every day, um, uh, with manned aviation, of course. And at that time, 2012, they realized that there were more and more UAS coming into the sky. and the traditional solutions to, to manage uh, traffic control at that time would not be able to integrate so many UAS uh, because already today there are way more UAS in, this, in the sky, as you know, than, than manned aircraft, right? And, and the curve is going to be exponential for the next years uh, with the commercial UAS uh, that will be flying. So very quickly they realized that um, the legacy um, air traffic management solution would not be able to do that. Having the human in the loop, the air traffic controller himself, um, it's, it's kind of an issue that would need to be solved. And that's how they came with the concept of UTM, um, which is UAS traffic management. So how to automate the process and, and somehow um, remove the air traffic controller from the equation to make sure that you can manage so many UAS in, in the sky. doesn't mean that the job for air traffic controllers will be removed on the longer term, but definitely there is a need to automate certain processes when it comes to UAS. That's what's, what's interesting is unpacking your message is a, a couple of key things. 2012, you started. Most companies in the UAS business aren't much older than that. That's, that's what UAS business is all about, recent startups, innovative startups. But in your particular case, you brought forward air traffic controllers who deal with air traffic management in the standard man system, and they know that very well, and all the issues and protocols and procedures, and that's where they started from. So they, they started from that operational knowledge base and brought it forward to the unmanned area, rather than having folks who deal with just the unmanned system try to find a way to integrate and mesh in with the man system. That's, that's a really unique uh, marker, and I did not know that. I appreciate you bringing it up. Then we have George. George, uh, uh, everybody knows George from the show many times. We've had to bring George all the way to Alaska to actually get him on the show as if we're in the studio here. No kidding. Because normally you're coming on by Skype from the sunny island of Lanai. That's right. And uh, thanks for coming on, George. But uh, Lanai represents a great opportunity to integrate this particular technology you're speaking of into an operating air structure system. Because we have the structure, but it's not heavily taxed. So it's a, a good combination. Plus we have a very interested and knowledgeable island ready to go forward in this domain as educated by George over the last couple of years. So George, tell us how the notion of integrating air traffic management on Lanai could, could execute. Well, for one thing, uh, this next coming year, we're actually preparing our annual, three-year annual uh, airport disaster plan, where we go out and actually do a scenario of a plane crash, and we have to manage also the air traffic and multi multiple agencies and we'll be flying a drone as part of the scenario. And one thing that you mentioned is on Lanai, we have no air traffic tower. So we actually have us firemen or airport maintenance trying to maintain control of the air traffic. 
So I see benefits right now just listening, again, what you said, that I see an implementation of how we can help me manage this whole scenario and make it less stressful. So we can actually use the coming exercise, incorporate your software in that exercise, and that would bring in automatically CTAF, the uh, common tower advisory frequency, which is the means by which air traffic is managed um, by the pilots and such at the airport. We could also use that to, uh, in, to connect in HCF, the Honolulu Control Facility, which is the big uh, air traffic management structure. They could all be part of this. Uh, and so we learn as we incorporate, and we do it as an exercise, which is a safe way to do it, plus, we are all part of the, uh, the one of the winning uh, programs in IPP under Alaska, which is the FAA's uh, integrating pilot program for integrating operations in the airspace, so we can learn from what's going on here in Alaska, I suppose that. Furthermore, wow, there's a lot of things here. Furthermore, we're also part of the unmanned uh, pilot program, which if we prevail and succeed in that, in that, in that competition, we'll actually have a lanai exercise to execute with more than just of the airport. We'll have uh, six locations on the island that are all dealing with UAS operations. So what's most interesting is that we came to Alaska to find out how this all comes together in Hawaii on the island, Manai, which is the uh, <laughs> the center of a lot of our attention these days. Yes. So, Lauren, how did, uh, how did you guys, I mean, your, your accent obviously indicates you weren't born in the U.S. You were born in some place probably called Europe. Indeed. And, and, and that brings the whole continental picture into the game. So you represent not just air traffic management, but also a, a European version. So we can actually capitalize on what's going on in Europe and blend this whole thing together in a small microcosm, uh, a macrocosm, and go forward. And, and that's a very good point you raised. That um, indeed, uh, the, the company has been founded in Belgium. Uh, we're now operating globally. Uh, we have. Uh, some projects in, in Asia as well, so outside Europe, in the US, obviously. Um, in Africa as well, uh, we've been working with UNICEF recently to, um, to manage uh, the drone corridor. They have a humanitarian drone corridor over there. Um, very nice use case uh, of blood samples uh, that would be transported from the local dispensaries to the, the main hospital. Um, but to come back to, to your point, indeed, um, we believe that on the longer term, uh, even though every country has um, it's taking a lot of decisions with regards to rulemaking or how to integrate UAS into the, the, the national airspace, in the end, you would need to harmonize um, the regulation. And, and that's something we have been um, heavily advocating for, um, being part of, of the different uh, international organiza organizations, both at European level, um, North America as well, and there are some global organizations, um, like ICAO, for instance, uh, where the, the civil aviation authorities for worldwide um, are gathering from time to time to look at those topics as well. well that's, that's really interesting and, and, and useful because uh, having Unifly involved ensures that we have this recognition of what is happening globally and is in compliance with the emerging standards. In fact, I brought that up the other day at the conference and said we got all these individual initiatives going. At some point in time, we have to kind of herd the cats and, and get them all paying attention to the way standards are being developed. Standards are coming out of, uh, in fact, I wonder where the standards are going to come from. AS, either ASTM or RTCA will be where the standards come from here, I would think. That's, that, that's a very good point. There are many organizations looking at um, the definition of standards at the moment. <laughs> definition, um, first of all, right? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and one of them, uh, well, ANSI, basically, yeah. um, is usually, well, focusing on, on the U.S., um, but in this specific case, ANSI is not let's say, is not looking at defining or uh, standards themselves, but what they plan to come up with is a roadmap, um, identifying all the initiatives that took place and what we, uh, where we should be and the gaps in between. And they will formulate recommendations and be looking at harmonization as well. So they're managing the overall standards process, not necessarily the standards themselves. That ANSI isn't going to tell ASTM what to do. It's a broader overview. In the yeah. And uh, I've noticed that Jim McCabe has been publishing a lot lately and as this is starting to happen. So through your efforts, once again, we in Hawaii and Alaska here can be connected in and make sure that we stay in, in sight, in, in, <laughs> in visible line of sight with the way the uh, regs are coming forward, which are going to come out of, the, uh, out, of the, out of the standards. So this is a most interesting time to be involved in, the, in any aspect of, of drones because we have all this evolution in technology, materials, performance, mission, and now 
air traffic management. So, George, another question for you, yes. if I can. Uh, uh, we have in our disaster management and uh, emergency operations systems, we have a well-structured system called the Incident Command System, and we have NIMS behind that guiding what ICS does. So as we get into uh, use of UAS in disaster operations, we'll have to find fit with the way the ICS is structured and the way incident commanders think and operate. So I think this is a great opportunity to take the structured aspect of UAS or drone flight management and associate it right up front with the structure that works best with ICS. Well, that's what I plan to do with this uh, disaster drill coming up with Unifly. Uh, for Lanai, it really fits because we have very minimal manning and any type of software or technology, we've always taken the first step in using it. And I have a pretty good idea of how your system works. I'm very excited to actually get it implemented and start playing around with it and working out how I am going to apply it. So that's the, by what you just said there, how I'm going to apply it. We're talking about the social acceptance of new technology and new probably training protocols and, and new operational needs that our incident command people are going to have to uh, align with in order to capitalize on this. So we could use, use this, I, I think it's a sort of a test case for how the incident command system is going to react to this kind of new uh, If it's complicated to use, then I can see we're going to get kickback. But if I can figure out a way and working with you to simplify it, to make it real easy in a stressful environment and helping manage your space and maintaining safety where we don't cause more accidents and we can actually uh, finish our rescue operation, then it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I see really two major benefits with, with that kind of exercise, uh, and, and you covered both actually. The, the first one is really reaching out to um, airspace users, re new airspace users with limited aviation background with a tool that gives them very quickly, um, easy to read information, um, how to grasp where you can or can't fly, um, how is the airspace actually regulated. Um, those, those are the kind of um, functionalities that UTM brings as well. And the other topic is what, what you just mentioned, um, coordinating different entities that are in a stressful situation, but even though um, would need to share the same airspace at the yeah. same time. And it could be a combination of manned aircraft, like helicopters, um, and UAS, since UAS is increasingly used uh, in that kind of situation. So that's really what UTM is focusing on as well, how to deconflict um, manned and unmanned aircraft in the same airspace at the same time. Well, you know, we just hit upon, in the conversation you just went through, we just hit upon one of the figures of merit that we can look at, uh, and, uh, and that is the reduction in stress, and certainly the lack of increase in stress. In fact, that correlates beautifully with some work we're doing with a company which I so greatly call Sierra Nevada Corporation out there in the ether space that's dealing with uh, uh, special forces operations and this sort of thing. They have the same issue. They, they, things are getting complicated, and the more we add technology to what they, they do or add another drop-down menu you've got to check off or another software load you have to do, it, that increases the stress in the decision makers and the people who are feeding decision makers information. So if we could collectively take on the obligation to reduce that stress and increase mission functionality at the same time, that's the, the absolute that's win. So yeah, the more I see what we're, the three of us are sitting here doing, this is getting better all the time. So <laughs> that's what we use this show for. We try to create real solutions to our problems and, and, and make them go forward. So George, I'm going to be summarizing a lot throughout this short time here because it, as these ideas are coming up, they, we have to catch them. But what we're doing is leaning on you to enter the uh, disaster planning drill for next year with this new initiative right up front. Oh, and that's what I plan to do. And then works. since we're talking about stress, when I was able to fly that drone at our disaster drill two years ago, it did eliminate a lot of stress. It made our event run more quickly, smoothly, and more efficient. So by adding Unifly as a management system, I actually free up one person to actually do human work instead of helping me manage the airspace. Let me interpret that for Lawrence benefit because he wasn't at, at that drill, but basically the, the, the drill was a simulated airplane crash right off the airport. 
and all the, re uh, the react the, the uh, first response people have to find it first of all, and they have to get to it. So you got access issues, you got location issues, you got fence lines. You have to think about. There's the usual things that impede access. But then the central command is off the island of Maui, on the, across the channel, and uh, the the need is for the people in the central in the EOC, the central command station, to observe the circumstances and allocate resources to be provided in. Okay. But instead of a guy on the radio saying, "I got." trucks over here, I got equipment over here, I need a chainsaw here. The people in the command center can see it directly. They can see where the equipment is being allocated, being located. They can see the line of sight folks had. They, they got the picture. So that took the man out of the loop, who would otherwise have to be the sportscaster interpreting what's going on. Mm -hmm. So then I could actually go and do my job. And that saved us at least 12 to 15 minutes of just work. And, and that's a very good point indeed. For many first responders, um, playing UAS is, is a tool. But it's not the core business. Um, and the way you put those tools um, available to, to those guys should help them to really focus on their core business, the, the, the first mission. Amen. That, and and that, that is such a mature attitude towards something like this. It isn't technology for the sake of technology. It's uh, uh, I had a, anecdotally, had a situation once where I was a general manager of an airplane program, and we just transitioning from from uh, what you might call mechanical or manual airplanes to computer-driven airplanes. And I had some young computer engineers who were thinking of what they can do with all the information they can now display in the cockpit. I had a dinner one night with the chief pilot who was architecting the cockpit with these young engineers and got a conversation going between them. And it was perfect. The, uh, uh, the pilot was saying what he needs, and the engineers were not understanding it. So that as the evening went on, the understanding gap got wider, and finally, one of the young engineers said, okay, Jim, what exactly is it that you want to display in the cockpit? I can display anything in that cockpit you want, in any form you want. And Jim said, I want to know two things. Are the houses getting bigger, or as I'm approaching something, or are the houses getting smaller? <laughs> he just wanted, you know, he didn't want all that individual data. He wanted his job stress reduced by knowing, am I heading in the right direction, or am I not? Yeah. So, so if we can incorporate that uh, through George's uh, team on the island, and then spread that to Maui, the rest of Maui, spread it to the big island, spread it to Oahu, tough one, and then go, hey, uh, we'll, we'll do something really yeah. really good here for a lot of people. But I can so, see this software helping a lot of the rural areas where minimum, where minimum manning is a key issue. Indeed. That's where we can focus, and once we show the benefits in that, the larger stations can actually now look at it and maybe make their scenario more efficient. So perhaps, George, along the way, as this develops on for your exercise, we could sort of informally let the other uh, counties know what's going on. Let them see what's what's going on. Let them contribute to the thought process that brings ideas in that are part of that the overall stress reduction. That's my plan. But here's cool. We, we got two figures of merit, overall stress reduction mm -hmm. and faster response. And something like that is, is the two things that matter here. Mm -hmm. yes. So, Lauren, uh, again, going back to the formation of, uh, of the company, how you guys got the idea to do this, how you got people together who were thinking along the same line. How did you manage to pull all that together? Yes. Um, so, um, indeed, it started in, in 2012, um, but it took us, uh, took the founders uh, a few years to really come up with um, a first architecture and, and product itself. It has been tested in Europe in, in, uh, in a very large uh, competition uh, organized, I think it was uh, 2014 in Europe. Um, hope it's uh, the right year. Um, uh -huh. Where there were 81 participants and, and Unifly ended up second, um, right behind uh, a very big company. So it, it, it was very interesting as a result and it somehow it proved the concept. Was that an academic exercise at that time? I mean, were you guys out of uh, out of graduate school or something like that, or no, no, it was really uh, organized for industry. Um, okay. So it, it it was really a very large competition at European level. Uh, we thought, okay, um, finishing second of that competition, um, it's a signal that we we have something yeah, here. You're uh, there, right? Absolutely, and um, and also it gave visibility. So um, the year after the company was really founded and incorporated, um, and it all started from there. Um, having some, some funding from um, Belgian organizations and, and uh, support from, from the technology point of view, uh, put a, a, a team together and um, 
here we are three years after mm -hmm. um, with some nice successes uh, first in Europe. Uh, actually, we, we are providing the technology to the equivalent of the FAA uh, in four countries in Europe, um, Germany, Belgium, Denmark, and Austria. Um, and the national authorities in those countries are really deploying the system at national scale to support all the stakeholders, not only the pilots, but also uh, when you look at, at uh, some of those countries, they are involving the local law enforcement authorities. Um, they are involving airports, and they are looking at exchanging data between UTM, so UAS, traffic management, and ATM, the, the standard solutions for manned aviation. So it's really interesting how things evolve. And it'll be interesting, taking that thought one step further, if developments that, that are developed here in support of UAS can occur, and are really positive. Is there a reason they can't work themselves, work their way backwards into general air traffic management? Are there not benefits that you can see in manned aviation management that would stem from what's developed here? And that, that's a very good point. Um, as I mentioned before, the, one of the main, let's say, characteristics of UTM is automating a process that comes from manned aviation. So once the, the, the concept is proven for UAS, Obviously, in the long term, um, there will be a lot of features and, and functionalities offered by UTM that could be applicable for manned aviation within ATM systems as well. And we, we've been looking at that for sure. Okay. Now, one last question along the line of where you came from and how this is all going. There must be some secret sauce, some proprietary thinking, some core kernel of calculating software that is the discriminator between what you do and what others are doing. Uh, what can you say about that? Um, well, not easy to reveal the secret source, of uh, course. I don't want you but, to uh, keep the company secret to your whole one, right? <laughs> but uh, I think, well, there are a couple of aspects. Um, one important one is, is the one we started with, is that safety and air traffic control background is at the core of what we are doing. Um, Unifly is not just, uh, let's say, a bunch of software developers in a garage. Uh, that happened to produce uh, an aviation software. No, it comes from the aviation background, safety, and the, those um, well-established processes uh, that exist within manned aviation are the ones we started from um, to, to build the, the application and to solve those specific issues. It happens that we provide software, but we're not a software, it's a pure yeah. software company, it's really an aviation company. That's, that's one key element. And um, the other one is indeed behind um, the displays and, and uh, the, the user interface. There are a lot of um, functionalities that are based on um, research projects. Uh, we're involved in a lot of them, um, and that's covering many different topics, um, ranging from um, how do you fuse data. There are a lot of ways to identify uh, and, and um, monitor and track uh, UAS or manned aviation in real time. So how do you fuse um, tracking data and how do you display that? Um, also related to cyber security, for instance. Um, obviously, having a software system at the core of your solution can be um, can offer a lot of threats from the cyber security point of view. So there are a lot of elements uh, we are looking at to make sure that the end-to-end -end solution is, is bulletproof from cyber security point of view. So the bulletproofness and the reliable, therefore the reliability and the safety that goes with that. Uh, some of the software developments that you're implying here and discussing are fairly abstract and probably hard for people to visualize. It, it, so the comparison of this system versus some other would really be in the mind of the beholder, and that's going to be defined by the, uh, by the screen, basically, and the, and the ease of interaction with the human factors. So there must be some, must be some human factors developments that you guys have gotten into as well in terms of screen interface and integration between uh, the existing air traffic management systems and this one, so it just plug and play in some way. Yeah, that's a very good point. Indeed, um, you may have different software functionalities running in the background, but the way you interact with the system is very different from stakeholder to stakeholder. Um, the way we've been looking at uh, at Unifly is having a kind of central platform with different interfaces, and each interface serves the needs of a different stakeholder. So the interface for the, the UAS pilot, commercial or recreational user, will definitely not be the same as the interface you would present to the air traffic controller if he wants to, to see UAS uh, flying nearby the airport. Um, that will be very different screens. Um, and indeed, those, those are aspects we've, uh, we've explored quite a lot. And, and yeah, here comes with the solution of different interfaces, making sure that it's tailor-made for, for your own needs and the information that you want to see. Uh, and I think it, it comes back to 
an element you mentioned before, that it's not the objective to overload um, the user with that many information that you would be able to send, uh, but really to put available the information that are required to that. And then the other thing that comes to mind, this goes back to Lanai, which is where we start and end everything, um, and, and we are coming to the end of our, our time here, but uh, George, this is the first thing we've really seen that can get us outside the rotorcraft itself or the, or, the, or the UAV itself and get us into the educational theme and the mathematical development and software and stuff. So this is a perfect connection in the school system on the island, I would think, because we're not talking just about the flying component of the drone anymore. We're talking about how to manage it. Yeah. And so uh, getting the kids interested in this, in, and, and this then leads to the math. As you and I were speaking yesterday, there is some high level of abstraction we have to get to here. There's some mathematical basis for what we're talking about here that we haven't quite defined yet. But everybody should think of Voronoi diagrams as a way to think about collision avoidance because we're talking about collision avoidance as the next thing. But once again, inspiration in the school system. They're taking a look at something they can look at on a laptop and the simulation behind it, they can run exercises themselves. Yes. So George, we got to bring this into the school system. So oh, I will. Because, uh, because a lot of the school children is actually our participants. So they will see firsthand how the system works, saving, pretending to save their lives. Yeah. So that's how we will gain more respect that way. Okay. So it's efficiency, speed, and safety, number one. Okay. And all measured by lower stress and higher productivity on the part of the operator. So we have come to the end of our time here for our Think Tech show, Where the Drone Leads, where we bring up subjects like this to the public. And Lauren, first time, first flyer, first time on this show. Hope you are a frequent flyer. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Thanks for inviting me. Who uh, else? Close enough from uh, Unifly, uh, in <laughs> out of a global company, basically, but changing the way that UASs are operated and finally getting into the operations side of this. So George Purdy, it first time actually on the show in the studio. Yes. The studio had to be moved to the Arctic Circle. But second time. Second. Well, last, it was even farther last time. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and folks, we'll see you in two weeks.